Welcome to The Church, I'm Brittany, where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. Our prayer is that this word aligns you with God, connects you in your daily experience with Him as we advance the kingdom. As this word encourages you, we hope that you will subscribe, like, comment, and share on all of our platforms. Exodus 9, 13 through 16. This is what God's word says. I'm reading in the NIV version. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Or this time I will send, watch this, the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. God is bad all by himself. For by now I could have stretched, watch this, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with the plague that would have wiped you off the earth. God didn't need ten plagues to do it. God said I could have done it, done it with one. But verse 16 says, but I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. We are finishing our series today, What Plagues Your Pace. Let's pray. Father, you have already moved in worship. Holy Spirit, you dwell within us. And Holy Spirit, I know you desire to give us a rhema word this morning. You desire to give us a wind, a fresh wind from elsewhere. So we say, Holy Spirit, come and move and do as you want in my life. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everyone say, amen. You may be seated. In doing some research It's been determined that the first three plagues that fell on Egypt, that they represented distress. You had the plague of blood in the waters in Egypt. You had the plague of frogs. And then you had the plague of gnats. These three plagues, they caused distress for day-to-day operations in Egypt. These plagues were an annoyance. They were hindrance, right? They were very distractive, very bothersome. Some of you parents in here, you have children that sometimes they annoy you. They bother you. I have a daughter. It's like, where's the batteries? Where's the off switch? Right? That's what these plagues were. They were an annoyance. They were bothersome. They got on their nerves. It hindered day-to-day operations. They just couldn't get up and just do what they had normally done. Come on, how many of you felt like that? You felt like, man, I just, I wish I could get a day or a, a week or a day where it just, can, can I get a normal, a normal, what's a normal day? I haven't had a normal week in some time. Then the next three plagues were considered painful and costly. The plague of flies, the plague of livestock, and the, the plague on livestock, and the plague of boils. You see, these plagues, they really hurt the economy. These plagues, they really hurt the people's faith in their false idols. These really hurt the morale of the people because all of their hard work for so many years was quickly being taken away from them. Their faith in their false gods cost them. Their faith in themselves, it began to cost them. Their faith in Pharaoh cost them. Their pride cost them. But then you got the the next four plagues that fell upon Egypt. And these ones were considered dangerous and destructive. You're going to hear that word a lot today. Dangerous and destructive. Now, we talked about one of them in the first part of this series when we talked about the plague of locusts. And some of you, 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 when you were here for that and, and you've been here through the duration of this series, probably wondered, well, Pastor Sonny, why did you take them out of order. Why, why did you do locusts first and then you went back? And, and how come you did that? And really, the only reason I'd come up to you is, well, that's the way God gave it to me, so that's the way I preached it. So that's just it. 
There's no, there's no rhyme or reason for it. But with the plague of locusts, we understand that the revelation by revelation of the Holy Spirit that was given to me to show you is that if you want to plague your pace in your walk with Christ, then don't have a hunger for God. If you want to be, if you want to be dangerous and destructive, then stop being hungry and thirsty for God. Without hunger for God, you're going to feed on the wrong things. You're going to try to fill, try to fill the God spot with cheap imitation, with second-rate false doctrine, with fool's gold. Come on, somebody. With knockoffs. Come on. False hope. And it's always going to leave you wanting. You try desperately to fill the God spot with another vacation, with another relationship, with another job, with another car. Come on, with another dream, another idea. But come on, somebody. The only way you're going to fill the God spot is if you stay hungry and thirsty for Jesus. Only God the Father, only God the Son, and only God the Holy Spirit can leave you never wanting for anything else that this world has to offer. So these last three plagues that I'm about to talk about briefly, they are also considered dangerous and destructive to our lives if we don't heed their warnings. If you don't learn, church, from these last three plagues, I will tell you that you will so plague your pace in your pursuit to be like Jesus that you will turn and walk away from him. Church, hear me clearly. I've been with the Lord this week. This is, this is not a recommendation. This is not a suggested recipe. This is truth. I'm here to deliver to you today his message for his people. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 is one of our scriptures for the year. As pace setters, they, we are desperately, right, trying to apply daily. It's simple. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. One translation says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You know, when I was younger, I wish I had somebody that, actually, uh, uh, I, I backed that up. When I was younger, I used to pray desperately, God, God, can you send someone that has, and I know you're here, Lord. I, I know you're here, Holy Spirit. But I would say it like this. I was so young in the faith, and I would say, Lord, can you just send someone with some skin on them to show me how to be like you? You ever get to that point where you can, can, can God, can you just show me somebody with some skin on them, at how, how I'm supposed to walk this thing out? And I'm so grateful that God would send me pastors and he'd send me leaders. He'd send me mature leaders, mature Christians who had walked some time on this earth, who showed me how to imitate Christ. See, I was imitating Christ through them. I was trying to be like Jesus through them. And church, I'm just, I'm just coming here to tell you, if you're looking for someone with some skin on them, you got two pastors right here who love Jesus desperately. We love God with all of our hearts. So if you're looking for an example, and, and I love it. I was so humbled this week on, on our group experience. Anissa was on, and she's saying, you know how I learned how to have some crazy faith? She says, by watching you two, because you are crazy with your faith, like reckless with your faith. Come on, somebody. There are some things that we have to turn from that are dangerous and destructive to our physical lives, to our spiritual lives. If we are ever going to be like Jesus, then we have to allow the Holy Spirit, which is the power within us, to purge out the dangerous and destructive I was so blessed last week when Brittany preached for Father's Day. And she said, if God is our Father and Jesus is the way, then what is the Holy Spirit? Is the power. It's the power within us, church. He is the power within us. I'm going to go a little further this morning. There are some people that can even be dangerous and destructive to the health of the church. 
that we have to allow God to purge. I'm going to tell you, I love God's people. I pray for you all, church. I mean, I went on a 40-day fast for you all. I went on a 40-day fast for people who haven't even walked into this church yet. If you walked in here today for the very first time, guess what? Before you even realize it, I bet I fasted for you for 40 days. Yeah. Why? Because I love God's people. Because I love his people. I love what he loves, and I'm trying to learn what, to hate what he hates. Come on, church. I want you all here. But the truth is, it's not up to me. You know, really? It's up to you and God. You have to want to be here. And Brittany and I have to trust that God knows what he's doing with, watch this, his church, not our church. There are some that are going to come and go in this church. My job, church, are you ready? You want to know one of, the, one of my jobs, ready? One of my jobs is not to go after you if you run away. That's not a job. Yeah, it is. Because you know how hard it is to not go after you? You know how hard it is not to call out your voice? You know what my job is? God says, Sonny, Brittany, stay here with the 99. I'm going to go get the other one. Come on, somebody. Stay with the 99. Steward the 99. Show the 99. Imitate me. Come on. Imitate me. Show them how to imitate me. I'll go get the other one. I'll go get them. And then it's like just when Jesus comes back with one, we God, another one went, I've I'll go get him too. You know, it's like we see God constantly walking this way and walking over here because he's getting this one and getting that one. You, did you know that Psalm 79 and 13 says that we are his people? We are the sheep of his pasture. We are his people. We're like sheep of his pasture. Did you know that it was custom that if a sheep had a tendency to wander from the flock, that when the shepherd found the lost sheep, you know what he would do? He'd put on the sheep, he'd put on what's called a, a leg break. A leg break. Now watch this. He wouldn't break its leg. That wouldn't teach the sheep. It would only bring fear, okay? He wouldn't break the leg to keep the sheep in the pack, no. But he'd put a leg break on the sheep to keep it from wandering off. To limit its mobility from going too far away. It was training that sheep to stay with the pack. If Sal were in here, Sal is over with the kids right now. Let's pray for Sal in the name of Jesus. Bless Sal. <laughs> Give him fresh, fresh oxygen, Lord. But if Sal were here, Sal would, he'd be like, he, Sal would call it a leg. <laughs> Hold up, wait a second. That's what that sheep had, a leg break, a leg, uh, because every time that sheep would want to walk away, it, it, instead it, it would try to go like this, but instead it had the leg break, and so it would be like, be like this, but it couldn't get far. It just couldn't get far. It had to look like, you know, and it probably grew so tired of trying to walk away and run away. Forget it. I'm going to stay here with the pack. Sometimes, church, God has to attach a leg break on us. It's not doing it to hurt us. <laughs> he's not doing it to hurt you. He's not putting a leg break on you to hurt you, church. He's doing it to teach you, stay with the flock. Stay connected to the church. Stay connected to the good shepherd. Why? Because daddy knows best. Father knows best. But if you are bound and determined to wander, I will tell you, you are dangerous and destructive to yourself, to those around you, and yes, to his church. So I got to just give you to the Father. I got 99. I got to I gotta try to show how to imitate Jesus. Come on, church. So since we are already talked, we talked already about the first dangerous and destructive plague with the plague of locusts. Got to have that hunger. Got to have that thirst. Let's talk about the second of these final four plagues. Are you ready? The plague of hail. Hail. If you have your Bibles, go to Exodus 9, 22 through 25. Exodus 9, 20 through 22 through 25. And I want to read this in the King James Version. So uh, hopefully they put that one up for me. Yep, perfect. Here we go. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, 
that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail. And I love this part. And the fire ran along upon the ground. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. Now watch this in verse 24. So there was hail and fire. Someone say fire. Mingled with the hail. Very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. I'm going to stop right there. It's apparent that hail was destructive in Egypt. I remember, this is off my notes, but I remember, oh man, it had it been seven, eight years ago, there was a huge storm here in the valley, a hail storm. And you would see remnants of that storm, that hailstorm, because there was a lot of cars that had to be totaled out because of the hail damage. Brittany, I remember, was in college at the time at ASU, and she had conveniently parked under one of the coverings. Our car got saved. Some of you look and you're like, some of you look and you say, you know, I don't see God's favor. You know, you see some things like that, and that, something like that, like God knew covered our car. We didn't have to total it out, you know. I, I thank God for the little blessings like that. To me, that's a, lot, that's a big blessing, you know. But I remember that hailstorm. It was a powerful hailstorm. Did a lot of damage. But this particular plague, it didn't just have hail, but the Bible says it had hail mingled with fire. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're talking about fire, so we might as well go to the very first church. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Starting in verse 1, and I'll be reading it from the NIV version. It says this, Acts 2, starting in verse 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. This is the disciples. In verse 2, suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And I love this in verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Spirit empowered them, right? We learned about that last week, how the Spirit comes in to empower you, church, to show you the power that's within you. It's the Holy Spirit, church. So here are two different fires that fell from heaven. You had a fire in the book of Exodus that talked about destruction. And then you had another fire in the New Testament in the book of Acts with the birth of the church. And it talked about empowerment. I'm here to tell you today that the fire is still falling today. And you can look at it as it is either destroying your life or it is empowering your life. You can look at the fire like it's destroying your plans. It's destroying your agenda. It's destroying your comfort levels. Or you can look at this fire as God's message to you that he is empowering you, that he is strengthening you, that he is giving you a discerning heart to distinguish between right and wrong. He is giving you a power, a renewed joy. It's either going to be destroying your life as you see it, or you will see it at is as it is God's hand of mercy and strength on your life. See, back in the day, I went to a little Hispanic church in the ghetto. And there was a woman who attended, who used to sing during our Sunday night services. I don't know why they call it Sunday night services. They should have just called it Sunday night open mic night. Because that's what Sunday night was. It was open mic night. You know, if you were a comedian, if you could do a human video, if you could sing, if you could give a, a testimony, all right, Sunday night was for you. 
Don't ever ask the pastor for the mic on Sunday mornings. That's for Sunday night. And there was this woman there on Sunday night. I remember. We, we knew her as Sister Bobby. Sister Bobby. Sister Bobby. I know she's in heaven now. Sister Bobby. But I remember Sunday nights she would uh, ask to sing. And I remember she would get up on that platform and have that mic. And the whole congregation knew what song she was going to sing. It's like, it was like we never heard it before, but we've heard it before. The song that she would sing was called, I'm going up the rough side of the mountain. And she would swing her arms as she'd sing it. You see, we didn't have no headsets or nothing, so we had one. So, and see, the mic would go in and out. Go up. Ah, we, you know, because she didn't know how to keep the mic right here in your mouth. And this is, this is something for all you who are going to be preaching in July. Keep it in right here, okay? We can't hear it on the, on the, they can't hear it on podcast. Keep it right here. But she'd sing that song. Going up the rough side of the mountain. When you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, church, his fire, I will tell you, you can go up the rough side of the mountain. Exodus 14.22 says it like this. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Some of you don't want to hear that. Some of you came to church and wanted to hear, so is today the day I get to go through the, the smooth side of the mountain? Is today the day I get to go through my troubles whistling Dixie? Is today the day I get to just go through without any problems? I've come to declare Exodus, uh, 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 Acts 14.22. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. See, you're going to have to just go through some stuff. Sometimes, church, as a Christian, as a person imi trying to imitate Jesus, come on. <laughs> Jesus had to carry a cross through the marketplace. Why the marketplace? Why through the business district? So that the world could see, the world could see how he loved you, church. He didn't go through a wilderness with that cross. He didn't go through a desolate uh, back alley. No, Jesus said, oh, I want everyone to see how much I love them. That's going through up the rough side of the mountain, church. That means there are going to be times in our pace setting that it feels like we're going through some rough stuff. That's the rough side of the mountain. Maybe Zap and Roger had something so rough, so tough out here. I don't know. Not the side where the trail is easily laid out for us, right? I've been on that path. We went up hiking, uh, I don't know how many months ago, my God in heaven. I don't go hiking, you know. And we went up, and they said, oh, this is a smooth trail. Smooth my, my, my butt. This ain't no, no. Not my hind parts. No, this is, this is rough. Where's the elevator? Where's the escalator? I was, I was. I was like, Brittany, I hope you're, in, I hope you're interceding for me because I don't need to fall. I'll tell you, church, the rough side of the mountain is going to test your faith in him. Especially when the situation that you're in, it makes no sense whatsoever. That's the rough side of the mountain. How many, how many, you don't even raise your hand because maybe everyone would raise your hand. How many of you are in that situation right now? You are like, this is the rough side of the mountain because none of this makes any sense. I don't understand what means is this. I don't understand why am I going through, why is this happening to me? Why am I here? That's the rough side of the mountain. The rough side of the mountain is when you have to give, you're on your last dollar. You're on your last dollar, but you know, God, <laughs> this is yours. I'm giving it back to you. And you said, you said, you said, Lord, you'll supply all my needs. You said, you said, I've heard someone say in that Bible, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Lord, I can't be begging bread, Lord. Come on, Lord. If I'm going to serve you, I'm going to give to you what belongs to you. And you said you'll give it back to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Yeah, he'll do that. But he needs to see your faith. He needs to see your faith on the rough side of the mountain. Come on, somebody. 
The rough side of the mountain is going to stretch your stewardship over what God has entrusted you with in this season, even though you believe you've been called to do something else. Yeah, but I've been called to be a supervisor. Yeah, well, God is trying to steward you to clock in on time. I'm supposed to run my own business. Yeah, but you can't even return an email or a text message to your friend. How are you going to return an email or text message to someone in business, to a new clientele? I'm supposed to be a pastor of a church. Yeah, but you can't even, you can't even steward over that soundboard back there. And I'm not talking about they're great. They're good. I'm not talking about you, Josiah. Keep my scriptures going up. That's all. Come on, church. The rough side of the mountain is, you know, the rough side of the mountain is if you're in church and you know you've been called in ministry, you know, the rough side of the mountain is it's door greeting. Greeting at the door. You know, that's learning you to to do. It's learning you to be faithful over the little that God has given you. Hey, if God told you, I've called you for a great purpose in church, then are you calling God a liar? When you come and you say, I need to leave because God has called me to pastor. Are you calling God a liar? Hey, you ain't hurting me. I'm just saying, church. I'm just saying, the rough side of the mountain, the rough side of the mountain is doing the things, stewarding the things, being faithful in the little things, staying the course. Come on, somebody. You know, how many of you have ever have ever driven somewhere and you needed some type of, of GPS system, right? What in the world did we do back in the day without GPS? How, how many of ever how many of ever tried to go get a map and read that map? How many of you ever opened the map? And then you had the audacity to say, "Hey Siri, If I'd have told you that you'd be in a relationship with the with someone named Siri back in the day, you'd be like, who's that? Who's that? Oh, you're gonna need her. <laughs> Google Maps, whatever. But if you've ever been somewhere, traveled somewhere, and and you typed in the direction, the, the address, you know, and, and so then the, the 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 GPS system, whatever you use, would begin to just talk right away, right? And in 500 feet, you're going to go here. And in and 100 feet, then you're going to go here. And then as, as you were approaching like a turn, right, it would say like in one mile, you're going to turn right. In a half a mile, you're going to turn right. In a quarter mile, you're going to turn right. In 500 feet, you're going to turn right. In 200 feet, you're going to turn right. In 50 feet, you're going to turn right. In, in 100 feet, you didn't make a U-turn, dummy. You went. Come on. You didn't listen to what I said. Come on. You ever, you ever use that GPS? And it's talk, 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 talk. It's like my two, two-year-old. It talk, three, sorry, three-year-old, talk, 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 you know, just won't be quiet. That GPS won't stop talking, right? But then you ever get to that point, and you're going somewhere far, right? And all of a sudden, it goes silent. It's silent, no talking. And you're like, okay, cool. Now I can listen to my radio. Now I can listen to the podcast without two voices, right? And, and, and you know, you go down, and then maybe you're traveling with someone and carrying a conversation, and you forget all about it. Or maybe you're listening to the radio, and, oh, the songs are just over and over. And, and, and maybe you're just daydreaming, right? You know, and you don't even know how fast you're going. And you pass up, I don't know how many DPS officers, right? But you're just in another world. And all of a sudden, it dawns on you. Wait a second. I haven't heard my GPS in a while. And you start to worry. Like, am I still on the right path? Like, did I miss the exit? Like, is the volume low? Is, did the phone die? What's going on? You start getting paranoid. You start freaking out. You know, and everyone in the car is asleep but you, thank God. And you're like, oh, I don't know. What should I do? You want to know the best way to know if you are going in the wrong direction? Get off the exit. As soon as you get off the exit, in 500 feet, take and make a U-turn and get back on the highway, dummy. Right? Make a U-turn. In 300 feet, make a U-turn. You are heading in the right direction. You, you, that's the best way to know. The best way to know if where you were going was still correct. Church, come on. 
One of my favorite scriptures that I quote a a, a lot around here, uh, according to Paul Samuel. (laughs) He called me out on Marco. Numbers. What is it? Numbers 2319. I put him on the spot. I'm sorry. Well, he says that I say it a lot. He, he called me out on Mark and says, one of pastor's favorite scriptures, Numbers 2319. He quotes it a lot. Numbers 2319 says it like this. God is not a man that he should lie, nor son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Come on, church. He didn't change his mind about the direction for your life. So don't be so overly concerned and paranoid about the current location. Just stick to the directions. God rarely talks after he gives you the instructions, right? God will talk in the very beginning. Read your Bible. Pray to me. Talk to me. Spend time with me. Get in a good church. Fast. Worship. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. But then after a while, God goes silent. And why does God go silent? Because nothing's changed. Because nothing's changed. And if nothing's changed, then he doesn't need to give you more of the direction. You already should know it because if you were paying attention, if you were looking at what he asked you to look at and stayed the course, you know God doesn't change the direction. Just stick to the plan. He changes mind. You're just getting paranoid. So here's the thing. That's going up the rough side of the mountain. When God has gone silent on your pace setting. When God has gone quiet and you want him to talk, here's just a bonus. The teacher rarely talks when the test is being given. So here's the deal. If you want the teacher to talk again, if you want the father to talk again, if you're tired of him being silent in your course that he puts you on, the rough side of the mountain, if you want God to talk again, well, here's the remedy. Then get to the top. Finish the test. Finish the race. Because when you finish the race, he's waiting at the finish line, waiting to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You fought the good fight. You have ran the race. You kept your pace. I couldn't wait to talk to you again. But if I talked to you during the test, you would have gotten distracted. Come on, church. The Egyptians so plagued their pace that they thought they could do it without God, without his spirit. And when the fire fell, they looked at it at destruction. But when we say, God, wreck this place. You ever hear that in the church? Wreck this place. I mean, it's like the modern day when Jesus was telling the Pharisees, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy this temple, right? Wreck this place. We say, God, wreck this place. What are we asking God to do? To the degree we are demanding that God wreck our plans, right? But at the same time, at the same time, make sure that you mingle that fire with us, Lord. Make sure you mingle your fire as you destroy my plans and my agenda. Make sure you mingle the fire, Lord, so that you can empower me to walk out this plan and purpose for my life. I need you, Holy Spirit. I don't want to do the church the same without you. The only way we do the most, church, is with the Holy Ghost. That's what we say around here. If you want to do the most, you do it with the Holy Ghost. You can't do the most by yourself. You can't do the most on your own strength. But you need the fire to mingle with you so you can do the most with the Holy Ghost. Here's number two, the plague of darkness. Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter, last week, Brittany says, Brittany said last week, oh, man, I'm preaching. Right? You said something like that, right, babe? I'm tearing it up. That's what she said. I'm more humble. I'm just kidding, girl. I want to sleep in my bed tonight. I'm just kidding. I know you were. I know. I'm just kidding. I'm stirring the pot. I got it. Exodus chapter 10, verse 21. Watch this. Chapter 10, verse 21 in Exodus. I'm reading out of the NIV version for this one. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt. 
And watch this. Darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and total darkness covered all Egypt for, watch this, three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. I'm going to stop right there. For three days, darkness fell upon Egypt. For three days, there was no movement. For three days, nobody could see each other. The Bible says for three days, darkness could even be felt. Have you ever been so afraid that you feel the darkness? Have you ever been, have you ever been in a place where you feel the darkness just closing in on you? You ever been there? All right, I'll go ahead and share, right? When I was little, I used to be scared of the dark, not afraid. I used to say, as scared. I'm as scared of the dark. Pues, pues, I'm as scared. I used to say, I'm so as scared. They had, to, they had to correct me. You're, you're afraid of the dark. Yes, whatever. I'm as scared, I'm afraid. I was afraid of the dark. I could feel the darkness. And you don't want to know what's interesting is that I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. Well, because Brittany sleeps right next to me, so I'm not afraid no more. I'm Brittany's like my, my nightlight. But I, I will tell you this. I will tell you this. This is on a regular, on a regular. Brittany can attest on a regular. I feel the darkness. I feel it. I feel I, regularly I get attacked. Regularly I get attacked. I feel, I feel this darkness just closing in on me. And you know the only thing that breaks it is the blood of Jesus. Is when I plead the blood of Jesus. Because his blood, it speaks better things on my behalf. That's what his word says. So that's why I plead the blood of Jesus. And, and his blood begins to speak a better thing over my life. In the mornings, I try to walk out of my bedroom into the hallway, down the stairs, into the kitchen without turning on the lights because I don't want to wake anybody up. But I will tell you that at 4.30 in the morning, it is dark in my house. I can't see anything. I can't see the steps before me. I can't see if there's a Barbie doll waiting for me on the stairwell or a Lego piece or a Hot Wheel car. I can't see nothing, church. All I see is darkness. All I can feel is darkness around me. And for three days, that's what it was like in Egypt. All day, every day, for three days. We got more light in here than they had for three days. Here's an example for you. Do you remember in 2020 when everything was shut down? When there was, remember this? When there was a curfew? Like we were like taught, like we were like teenagers on a curfew. Remember that? No one could go out past a certain hour. I couldn't even remember what time it was. Was it five, six, seven o'clock? I don't remember. But there was a curfew, right? Everything was closed. Shopping plazas went dark. Malls went dark. Restaurants went dark. Stadiums went dark. Parking lots went dark. Hotels went dark. We worked in an industry, in a, in a wedding industry, where we relied heavily on, on reception ballrooms and, and hotel reception halls, right? We relied heavily. Weddings went dark. The hotels went dark, church. Churches went dark. Freeways and streets do you remember what that did to the economy? How many businesses never reopened? How many churches never reopened? Do you remember what it did to people? Do you remember the fear that it brought? There are still people we see walking around in fear because of what happened, because of the darkness that fell in 2020. Here's another example. If you work in an industry where if you don't work, you don't get paid, you know how important it is that you stay healthy as possible. If you can relate, you can, can you imagine what being sick for three days is going to do to your business? You know that if you get sick, you can't just use a sick day, right? Call in sick and still get paid. Or call in sick and know that your work's going to get done. Someone's going to pick up the slack for you. And when you come back, all you got to do is answer a few emails. No, it's going to cost you. 
And the longer you're sick, the more money you lose, the new business you potentially miss out on, and current clientele you start to jeopardize. Or here's another example. Can you imagine that if during the month of July, here in Arizona, when your kids are home for the summer, from, from school break, you lose your power in your home for three days? All that food in your freezer and fridge, the heat, the smell, especially when your kids are outside running around, and then they come inside, and they just throw themselves on the freshly washed sheets. Am I just talking to Brittany and I? What if you have to work from home? And your AC goes out. The power goes out for three days. That's, that's devastating. That's destructive. When we don't live a life for Jesus, church, it's like living in darkness. Church, that's dangerous and destructive. I'm talking to someone here today. When you live in darkness, that's dangerous and destructive. It's like living with everything shut down. You can't enjoy life. You can't celebrate. You can't enjoy the company of others. You are quarantined from opportunities and blessings. You're losing out of new doors being opened up to you. You're jeopardizing current healthy relationships. And you get so used to the fear that you never want to open up again or you start to live fearful lives. Living in darkness, which is a life apart from Jesus, it's uncomfortable because there is no circulation of fresh air. There's no fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. There is no confirmation that this is the way because you have chosen your own way. Come on, church. There begins a smell that reeks of failure, shortcomings, shoulda, coulda, wouldas, regret, compromise. Everything you fought for and saved for and protected is gone and destroyed and has gone dark because you have chose darkness. We choose to live in darkness, church. John 3 and 19 puts it like this in the King James Version. And Samson, he knows this scripture, John 3 and 19. It says, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world. But men, watch this, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is Jesus talking. Jesus was talking and saying that light, came into the world. There were people who came and preached the word and did miracles, signs, and wonders, prophets, people, teacher, teachers you read about and you will read about. He was teaching the people and he was saying that light came into the world. But men, what did they do? They loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Their intentions were evil, church. When you choose to live in darkness and you choose to accept the results of living in darkness, it's because your intentions are evil. Light has come into the world, and the question is, why would you love to live in darkness if these are the results and these are the outcomes? Ask yourself that question right now. If you find yourself living in darkness, apart from Jesus, where you feel the darkness. You don't feel any light. Come on. In your pace setting, you have to every day choose not to live, not to love darkness. I'm going to say that again. In your pace setting, you have to every day choose. Pull that scripture up so they can see it, that John 3 and 19. Every day, church, you have to choose not to love darkness darkness. Leave that scripture up so they can see it because they need to see this. In your pay setting, you have to every day come out of your evil intentions. I'm going to say this. From now on, anytime I meet with someone, anytime I counsel someone, anytime I mentor anybody, the first thing I'm going to ask you the first thing I'm going to ask them is, how's your daily experience with the Holy Spirit? Because that's it. We can stop right there. How is your daily experience with the Holy Spirit? But my job, my family, my marriage, 
How's your daily experience with the Holy Spirit? How is your daily experience? We stop right there. You want to know why it's falling apart? You want to know why it's falling to pieces? You want to, come on somebody. You want to know why you're getting the outcome you got? You want to know why you're ending up in the mess you are? You want to know why? How's your, how's your daily experience with the Holy Spirit? I'm not talking about your Sunday experience. I'm not talking about the group experience. I'm talking about the daily experience, the experience that nobody else sees. How's the daily experience with the Holy Spirit? Come on, somebody. Sometimes, I'm here to tell you, sometimes it is not the devil setting up the trap and the snare. Sometimes you're the devil. Sometimes you're the devil. You are your worst enemy sometimes. Because you don't want to be in his daily presence. You don't want to get in his, his presence daily. You don't want to commune with the Holy Spirit daily. And I'm here to tell you, your flesh has evil intentions. This stuff right here, all this stuff right here, this stuff don't love. It don't love to praise and worship. It don't love to fast. Right, Charles? It don't love to worship. It don't love to read the Bible. It don't, like to, it don't love to apply the Bible. Your flesh loves. It loves. It has evil intentions. Evil intentions. It loves the darkness. You have to choose every day not to love the darkness. Not to love the darkness. Come on, church. But what about my wife? What about my kids? What about my, my money? What about my dog? Now, some of you, you come, you come at me with, you know, pray for my dog. Pray for my money. Pray for my spouse. Right? And I say, well, see, you got it wrong right there. See, now I know you don't have a daily experience with the Holy Spirit. You just, you just, you just gave yourself away. Why? Because you use that word M-Y, my. See, when you have a daily experience with the Holy Spirit, then you know that ain't my, that ain't my spouse. There's, them ain't my children. That's not my job. That's not my money. It's not my dog. That's his. All it belongs to his. Why do you think we change the signs on these giving stations? You, have you bothered to even look at and see what they say? What do they say? Return. It ain't my money. I'm returning it back to God. Why? So he can bless the rest. Bless the rest, Lord. Because it's all yours anyway. Well, we got to learn. When you get in your daily experience, God, if it all falls apart, it was all yours anyway. And if you take it all away, that means you're only making room for more. When people talk, I'm, I'm going to be real. I'm going to be real, church. How's your daily experience with the Holy Spirit? When people talk about homosexuality and they say, ooh, Ooh, Sonny, you talk. Yeah, yeah. When people say, well, I can't help it. I was born this way. You know what I want to tell them? You know what? You're right. You were born into sin. All of us were. Some of us were born into alcoholism. Some of us were born into drug addiction. Some of us were born into a porn addiction. Some of us, oh, it's getting quiet in this church. Some of us were born into idolatry. We were all born into some type of evil intention. Come on, you have an evil intention. Some of you, some of you, you can't, you can't even look at HBO without that evil intention perking up. Some of you, you can't even open the fridge or the pantry because you got an evil intention perking itself up. Some of you can't walk down certain neighborhoods. Some of you can't go into certain places. Some of you can't walk and watch a movie. You can't even go to the gym because there's an evil intention inside of you and it wants to come out. And I'm here to declare to you today, if you want, if you want to get rid of the evil intentions, baby, then Jesus said it best. You must be born again. You may have been born this way, but that's why you got to be born again. Come on, somebody. John 3, 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, unless you are reborn in the spirit of God, you are living in darkness. And when you are in the darkness, baby, you can't even see the kingdom of God. When you're in the darkness, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't see it. Why? Because you're in the darkness. But when you come out of the darkness, 
This is the best part. This is the part I can't wait. You have to come out of that darkness, and you got to come into the light. That's when you can see. That's when you can see. See, this afternoon, we're going to baptize six souls in a watery grave called the Faulkner Pool. That's right. But they are coming up into the light. They are declaring outwardly of an inward confession that they choose the light. They no longer choose darkness. Come on, somebody. This plague is all about you choosing the light er day. Not every day. Er day. That's right. And additionally, not just choosing the light, but being the light. Oh, I love this part. Exodus 10 and 23. See, I stopped short because I didn't want to give you the B clause of Exodus 10 and 23. But the B clause says this. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. You see that? The Egyptians were in darkness, but the Israelites were in light. Sometimes, church, where you are at might be dark, (laughs) <laughs> but I've come to declare that wherever you roll, you know, no, it's light in here. Darkness leaves when you walk in the room because light just walked into the room. Come on, somebody. I've come to declare to some of you students in here, don't you be afraid of the darkness in your schools. Don't you be afraid where well, they didn't set up enough security. They don't have enough gates, and, and we don't have metal, metal detectors. And, and what if something happens like what happened in New Mexico? I've come to declare to you students, you are the light, be the light. Walk in the darkness and tell the darkness, I'm here. It was dark till I showed up. Because I'm an imitator of Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. I'm trying to be the light. Come on, somebody. Yeah, I'm tearing it up. Yes, you're right. I feel it now. I know what you're talking about, girl. I know what you're talking about, girl. It could be darkness all around you. But if you (laughs) remain in Christ, (laughs) it's light where you are. You know, this week on Marco, Caesar... Caesar was, uh, he was singing an old Sunday school song I grew up on. He was singing an old school song I grew up on in Sunday school. Some of you aren't privy to Sunday school. I grew up in Sunday school. And the Sunday school I grew up on, they would sing this song. It'd go like this. It'd go, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Ooh, I feel the spirit. This little light of mine, come on. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Now, I love this verse right here. I love this verse. Hide it under a bush. Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bush. Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bush. Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And I love this part here. Won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Come on. Won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Come on, tell the devil. Won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Come on, church. As a pace setter, come on, church. As a pace setter, if you don't want to plague your pace, baby, you got to let your light shine. You got to be the light. Go back Sunday school style. I'm going to let it shine, devil. I'm not going to let you blow out my light. I'm not going to let trouble blow me up. I don't care if I'm going up the rough side of the mountain. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. I will shine brighter for Jesus. Come on, church. I'm only going to love fiercer. fiercer. I'm only going to shine brighter. I'm only going to pray harder. I'm only going to fast longer. I'm only going to sing louder. Why? Because a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Come on, church. We're supposed to be a city on a hill. This church is a city on a hill, and a city on a hill cannot be hid. We got to let our light shine, church. We got to be the light. We can't just be in the light, but we got to be the light. Why? Because we're imitators of Jesus, and if Jesus is the light, then we are the light. Who, Jesus. 
Here's the last plague. I'm not finishing. I'm semi-finishing, but I'll let you know. The last plague, Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11. Looking at verse 1. Thank you, Caesar, for sharing that. Ooh, I'm going to tell you right now, people. Don't say something around me because I might end up in a message someday. <laughs> Exodus chapter 11, starting in verse 1. In the NIV version, it says this. Now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. And after that, he's going to let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. So tell the people, the men, that men and women alike are to ask their neighbor, neighbors for articles of silver and gold. The Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people. And Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. So this last plague, we're understanding that this final plague was going to be so severe, so dangerous, so destructive, that the, their enemies would, be, would give them everything they had to tell them, get away from me, take everything, because your God, apparently, is a God of all gods. So verse 4 says, so Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the female slave, who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. I want to make this last point as simple as possible, church. If you want to avoid plaguing your pace in your pursuit of living a godly life, living sold out to Jesus, I will tell you, you have two choices. You either look at what God is doing as taking or giving. Failing to choose to look at it from the right perspective will be dangerous and destructive for you. God took from the Egyptians their firstborn, but God gave to the world his only begotten son. You can either look at life like God is taking everything from you, or you can look at life as God is giving everything to you. When we look at the positive sign of this plague as pace setters, we see that God has given us his grace. He could have taken our lives, but instead, he has given us his grace. We have been saved by grace. Did you remember in, when I read in the beginning in chapter 9, when God said, I could have wiped you all out. I could have stretched my hand out. But you know what? It was his grace. Come on, church. Ephesians 2.8. I love it. Yes, one of my favorite scriptures says it like this. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. You see that? Grace is a gift of God. Grace is a gift. God is a gift giver. God is a gift giver. It, if he takes, it's so that he can give the gift of something better. I, I'm telling everyone in here, you need this gift called grace. You need the gift of grace. Don't act like you don't need it. Without it, you'd be dangerous and destructive. You need God's grace. I know sometimes that when I preach a message like this, there are people in the church that all of a sudden they act all hoity-toity. Like, you know, your stuff don't stink. Like, you know, you are perfect. And if you are perfect, next week I want to hear you preach and every Sunday after that because I don't know everything and I'm not perfect. We walk in here sometimes, like, I don't put my hand like this, I'm like I'm perfect. I, I don't know. We just act like we, I'm looking, I'm like, what is wrong with you? We are acting like we are perfect, you know. You are, think you are perfect all by yourself. But the truth of the matter is, you are dangerous and destructive when you don't live under God's grace. You need his grace, church. Come on, listen, I know, I know I tell you, I have been saved all of my life. But the truth of the matter is that it was at the age of 16 that I fell in love with Jesus. I feel like that's when I married him. I feel like that's when I married his purpose for my life. 
But you know how many times since I have been married to Jesus? Do you know how many times since then that I have still acted dangerous and destructive? I'm about to set someone free here today with this. I wish I could tell you, church, I wish I could tell you then from the moment I married Jesus that I never went back. I wish I could tell you I never went back. I wish I could tell you I never said those things again. I wish I could tell you I never thought those things again. I wish I could tell you I never went back and did that and tasted that and walked that. I wish I could tell you that since I was married to Jesus, I've never gone back, church. I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I feel and you got to read your Bible to you understand what I'm about to say. Sometimes I feel like the prostitute Gomer in the book of Hosea who just kept going out and going out. Even though she was married, she was a pastor's wife. She was married to a godly man. Just kept going. Sometimes I feel like I'm married to God. I'm married to Jesus. But sometimes I just, I would go back and I would go back and I would go back and I justify it. I try to justify it. Come on, church. Come on, church. I wish I could tell you. But I love what Paul said in Romans 7, 15. In Romans 7, 15, Paul said, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Later on, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. Church, I'm terrible to tell you. Every time that I have gone back, since the time that I married Jesus and I felt his call in my life, every time that I went back, you know what he did? He left the 99 to come back and find me. And you know what he said? My grace goes again. Go get him again. Go get him again. Go tell him I love him again. Go get him again. And again. And again. And over. And again. And again, and again, and again. He kept going back for me. He kept going back, to, and he put a leg break on me. And I would, I would still try to hobble my way. But he said, no, go get him again. Go bring him back again. Why? Because my grace, it covers again. It covers again. It covers again, church. His grace, it kept covering me every single time that I went back. And without his grace, church, you too will be dangerous and destructive. That's why you need God's grace. Some of you in here, you may act like you're perfect, but if you... If if I were to put your stuff up on this screen, oh, I know you get all quiet real quick. You know what, media team, go ahead. All the stuff I sent you about me, I want you to put up on these screens right now for everyone to see. I want you to put up on the screen all the stuff that I sent you, all that stuff I sent you. Put all my junk, all the stuff that I've done and put it on the screen. They're frantically looking back there. You know what? I'll let the devil do it. Go ahead, Satan. Put it up there. Put all the stuff that I've ever done. And I know some of you would look and you would say, oh, my, I can't believe Pastor Sonny did that. I can't believe, oh, I never dreamed he would have done that. And you know what God is saying? God is sitting in here too, by the way. And God looks up and he, and he, looks, at, he looks and he says, I didn't know that too. Because the last time I checked, I covered all that. The last time I checked, I redeemed all that. The last time I checked, that don't exist. God has amnesia. He don't remember what you did because his son's blood washed it away. Because the grace covers it all. That's why you need the grace. You need God's grace. Because it'll keep going back for you again and again and say, come on, son. Get up here again. Come on, my daughter. Get up here again. Come on, son. You can do it. Nisi, I got you, girl. And God says, I got you, girl. Come on. My grace covers you. Come on, Pastor Brittany. I know they lied on you. I know, but I got you, girl. Come here, girl, my daughter. You're a young generation, but don't you worry. My grace covers. Get over here. Go ahead. My grace. My grace covers you. Come on, church. His grace. His grace. It's his grace. It's his grace. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We pray that you were blessed and stretched by today's word. Maybe you need a prayer or have a question for us here at the church. Make sure to fill out our contact form on our website at thechurchphx.com. And stay connected with us on our Instagram and Facebook at the Church PHX. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday at our 10 a.m. Sunday experience, either in person or online. And remember, we are the church, building a church for God around the presence of God. 